Even though the conflicts in eastern Ukraine seem to be working against Russia in recent days, Russia continues to hit western Ukraine with cruise missiles, with its submarines and warships in the Black Sea. Even if the Ukrainian armed forces shot down most of the Russian cruise missiles, it cannot stop. All the Russian missiles landed in Lviv on the eastern European border. These attacks on Lviv and Russia's ongoing attitude since the first day of the occupation caused the eastern European countries to increase their defenses. Poland became the prominent country in Eastern Europe, sharing a long border with Belarus and Ukraine. NATO provided very strong troop support to Poland, while the Polish armed forces developed its military arsenal and stockpiled many weapons on the border. We can count the M1 at 2 Sep 3. Abrams as the most powerful of these weapons normally, Poland agreed to supply 250 M1 at 2 Abrams tanks by 2025 in its first agreement with the USA. However, the aggressive stance of Russia and the possibility of attacking NATO allies in Eastern Europe after Ukraine encouraged the Pentagon to send Abrams to Poland as soon as possible. Pulling forward an M1 at 2 Abrams V3 shipments, Poland is developing its army with 15 Abrams per month and deploying this world's most advanced main battle tanks at its military bases on the Polish-Ukrainian border. The total of 30 M1 at 2 Abrams tanks are thought to be in Poland at the moment. The placement of these tanks on the Polish territory on the Lviv border will be used as a deterrent against the Russian army. At the same time, the presence of US army units and tanks in the region is seen as a deterrent for Russia. There are several other important titles in the Polish shipment of the M1 at 2 Abrams tank. The first of these is whether a superior weapon such as the M1 at 2 Abrams 3 can be shipped to Ukraine. In the first period of this shipment, it was said that if such a powerful weapon was delivered to the Ukrainian armed forces, the Russian army would be completely helpless. However, this situation was not brought to the agenda in any way because it would not be accepted by the USA, because sending such a powerful tank to Ukraine would involve very serious risks that could fuel the conflict between the USA and Russia. Also yesterday, Russian President Vladimir Putin reacted sharply to the sending of advanced long-range missile systems or heavy weapons to Ukraine. And he firmly stated that if the shipments continued after that, he would hit areas that he had not hit before. It was not specified which regions it was and where it could attack. However, shipments to Ukraine are usually made via the Polish border, and Russia may be likely to target that area here. Poland's acquisition of Abrams tanks would mean that it would be able to send hundreds of Soviet era T-72 upgraded tanks in its military arsenal to Ukraine. This is thought to be the main purpose of the urgent dispatch of the M1 at 2 Abrams to Poland. Another issue was the shipment of M1 at 2 Abrams tanks to Poland and Poland's large tank shipment to Ukraine. Poland delivered 232 Tesla 72 tanks to the armed forces of Ukraine. Soon after the shipment of M1 at 2 Abrams tanks accelerated in the delivery of the first 15 was completed. With this move, there were great changes in the fate of the ground operation in Ukraine, with the shipment of T-72s in the hands of Poland to Ukraine. Ukraine immediately started to use these tanks actively in the region. It is reported that these tanks are currently fighting on the front lines in the Kherson, Severodonetsk, and Kharkiv regions. So why are the M1 at 2 Abrams tanks such important tanks, and why were their shipments to Poland brought forward? Let's take a closer look at this issue together and examine it more deeply. M1 Abrams tanks are actually older tanks over 40 years old, known as the Children of the Cold War. But despite being over 40 years old, Abrams has been upgraded to keep up with Russia's new tanks, like that 90 and Damata. So how is this modernization possible? The M1 and 2 Abrams are described by war experts as very attractive, bent steel. There is no need to explain the M1 and 2 Abrams at length. It is already known by everyone that they are groundbreaking vehicles in war. However, it is necessary to focus on the features that make this tank stand out. 
M1 and 2 Abrams stand out with their thick armor, speed, maneuverability, and guns hitting and destroying their targets with precision. The M1 Abrams originally only had the 105mm square Delph 52 M68 one rifled gun. The rifle creates more friction in the tube and therefore a smooth burr gun is more preferable. The M1 graduate to the M1A1 version in 1985. During this development period, the tank was armed with a more powerful 120mm square Dell 40 for M25601 smooth bore gun. The RH-120 is a 120mm squared smooth bore tank gun designed and manufactured in former West Germany by the Rhine Metal D Tech Company. These are extremely powerful and devastating weapons that are also used on the latest German Leopards. Abrams fires a high explosive anti-tank shell and a powerful depleted uranium shell from this 120mm squared artillery gun high explosive obstacle reduction projectile for destroying lightly armored vehicles and bunkers. The depleted uranium shell acts as a shotgun and destroys the enemy's armor. The M1 A2 Abrams consists mainly of rolled homogeneous armor, steel plating and British capped cobham composite armor. It also has depleted uranium armor layers. This high density, 1.7 times denser than lead-free uranium armor mesh provides outstanding protection and is added to the hull in front of the turret of the tank. This gives it a very large degree of protection, even against anti-tank projectiles, which are especially prominent in Ukraine. But you need a very powerful engine to carry such a powerful armor. It is very unlikely that you can beat the engine of the M1 A2 Abrams. It has a 1500 horsepower Honeywell AGD 1500 gas turbine engine that can use different fuels. It has a torque of 2,768 FT at 3,000 revolutions per minute. The gas turbine was once a type of helicopter engine converted into power tanks. The maximum speed of this engine is 68 kilometers and it surpasses many rival tanks in this regard. It can also cover almost 450 kilometers on a single full tank. In addition, the engine runs much quieter than other tank engines, which makes it stand out in sudden city raids. On top of these features, the US military has given Abrams excellent communication systems, enviable fire targeting, and durable countermeasures, along with the latest developments. Since the M1A2 was introduced, it has been developed in many variants. The latest of these variants will be set to 3 and soon 4. The first edition first delivered to the US Army in 1999 included improved armor protection, improved system components, and more importantly, improved computer components. V2 builds on SEP by adding a remote-controlled weapon station. Abrams' latest and modernized configuration, V3 is now considered the foundation for the future of incremental upgrades released in 2017. V3 adds additional armor, including explosive reactive armor, as well as a trophy active protection system. The trophy system is a hard-to-kill system designed to fire shotgun-like blasts to take down incoming threats. In addition, the manually loaded 120mm square Dex M256 smoothbore cannon can reliably and accurately hit targets almost 3 miles away. This makes it a formidable weapon on the field, while the M1 A2 Abrams are already very powerful weapons. The V3 version of the M1 A2 Abrams has made it one of the eyes of the battlefield, and the king is on his way to reclaim his throne. One thing is for sure as Abrams SCP variants progress, they will see a lot more customers than the US Army alone. We talked about the 250M1A2A2 Abrams V3 agreement that Poland made at the beginning of the year. In addition, it has signed an agreement with the USA for 75 SPV3 in Australia. It seems that the demands of the Eastern European countries for these unique tanks are increasing day by day, particularly NATO member countries which want to strengthen their army maneuvers in the face of a possible aggressive attitude of Russia, want to increase their offensive power in ground operations by adding these tanks to their inventory. Even if Russia is thought to have lost a quarter of its army in Ukraine at the moment, 
Putin could increase his aggression at any moment. Regardless, Russia is the country with the second strongest army in the world, and it should be everyone's primary goal to have weapons that can respond to the weight of its attacks. Russia's losses in Ukraine continue to surround Putin with all their influence. While many names from the opposition party in Russia heavily criticized Putin for the invasion operation in Ukraine, at the same time, the majority of the soldiers in the Russian army began to criticize Putin. The soldiers who have been fighting in the region for months in particularly difficult conditions and losing their friends with their military equipment are in a state of psychological exhaustion. Not only the mental, but also the physical. Reflections of this exhaustion are clearly visible. But Putin's nightmare also seems to be coming true in the audio recordings released by Ukraine's special intelligence. The heavy criticisms of two senior Russian colonels about Russian President Vladimir Putin, Defense Minister Shoigu and Vornikov, who led Ukraine's operation in Donbass, were shared. The criticism of the two Russian colonels against the Russian soldiers, army and leaders was very harsh, and it was the living proof that the second army of the world was just a joke. The conversation is detected by the Kiev Intelligence Secret Service. The seized, documented audio recording begins with a disparaging comment about Russia's defense minister and army general Sergei Shoigu, whom one of the colonels describes as totally incompetent. And that's just the beginning. Colonels criticize Shigu's failure to take any action in the Ukrainian war and say that he fled the war. One of the colonels, Vlazov, describes General Alexander Dvornikov, the commander of the Russian army in Syria, who earned him the nickname the Butcher of Aleppo and Grozny as a complete and absolute imbecile. Let's not forget that Vornikov was dispatched to the region by Russian President Vladimir Putin himself and was given full authority to lead the entire operation in Donbass. Dvornikov was honored with the Hero of Russia medal in 2016, the continued Russian casualties after the general was appointed commander-in-chief of Russian forces in Ukraine, which was expected to turn the tide of the war on the whole caused a complete loss of respect for this ruthless commander. Angry Russian colonels also harshly criticize other colonels in the lieutenants in the Russian army, angry colonels. He states that no high-ranking Russian officer knows how to fight. No one wants to and no one else is taught anything else as they just walk around with a military salute. When the Russian army started its invasion attempt to Ukraine, it entered the region with thousands of soldiers. However, most of these soldiers were recruits and also their senior officers had no combat experience. This inexperience seemed to be eliminated with numerical superiority, but nothing turned out as imagined. While the Russian army was crushed by the Ukrainian armed forces in Kiev and Chernihiv, these recruits and officers had to wait desperately for death. One of the most important issues between the two colonels was that Moskva did not respond in any way to the Ukrainian armed forces in the loss of the Slava-class Moskva cruiser. Two colonels stated that Moskva, which sank without doing anything, was a waste of time. Moscow's claim that the ship sank with an unintentional explosion inside the ship went down in history as a big lie with this speech, and it has been proven that the Ukrainian armed forces hit Russia's Black Sea Fleet flagship, Moskva with Neptune strike anti-ship missiles. Kovtin, one of the two colonels, said that harming civilians should not be avoided at points where the Russian infantry might be harmed and he harshly criticized Russia's ground operation strategy. The colonels who also talked about the atrocities inflicted on Ukrainian civilians said that this was legitimate and that they supported these harsh practices. Another important issue in the conversations between the two was that Putin did not support the destruction of the parliament building in Kiev. Two colonels criticized Putin on this issue and argued that this war could be won from the beginning by demolishing the parliament building in Kiev. Internal opposition continues to spread among the highest army ranks in Russia, as audio recordings from the Ukrainian intelligence agency show two Russian colonels serving in the troops sent by the Russian army to Donbass, harshly critical of Russian President Vladimir Putin and other military leaders. 
This was one of Vladimir Putin's worst nightmares, and it seems to be starting to come true. The unrest in the Russian army continued to increase. However, it was not a known fact that the Russian administration was criticized so harshly among high-ranking soldiers. These sound recordings had a slap-up effect on Putin. In the shadow of these criticisms, Putin still aims to invade all of Ukraine. This is also confirmed by American sources. Despite initially portraying his invasion of Ukraine as a peacekeeper designed to liberate the Luhansk and Donetsk regions, Russian President Vladimir Putin reportedly plans to take full control over Ukraine. Putin, who plans to complete this invasion by taking Kiev on February 24, aims to reach the final result with smaller steps after the harsh defense of the Ukrainian armed forces. Even if NATO countries continue to supply heavy weapons for the country's defense, it was announced that the Russian president still intends to exert as much control over Ukraine as possible. A Pentagon official said in a statement that Putin did not have the capacity to achieve the glorious victory he had dreamed of. However, at this point, aside from the obvious fact that he is trying to avoid embarrassment, no one really knows the intentions of the Russian president in Ukraine. Not only is Putin under pressure to achieve some kind of victory in Ukraine to justify the economic turmoil that Western sanctions have caused his people, but his standing on the world stage is probably irreversibly compromised at this stage. Putin has completely lost his credibility. In addition, it cast a great shadow on the reputation of the Russian army. The Russian army, which is seen as the second largest and strongest army in the world, was disgraced by not being able to pass the Ukrainian defense. The dreamed victory in Ukraine did not come true, and Putin lost a lot of things and will continue to lose it. There are few people around him who support him, and the Russian people no longer believe his rhetoric. Instead of the victory songs he dreamed of, Putin admitted his defeat by announcing that he was withdrawing from Kiev and Chernihiv in March. Changing his goal to liberate Donbass did not change the situation, and the world community will remember Putin as a loser. However, this does not mean that Vladimir Putin will not divert operations to central Ukraine if he successfully takes control of the Luhansk and Donetsk blasts. If Putin's army continues to make gains in the region using ex-Soviet-era weapons to effectively bombard residential areas and push Ukrainian troops west, then a commitment to take control of Kiev may be out of the question. It is not known exactly how long he can continue this crazy war, but Putin will continue to be a victim of his ambitions because with his high ego and character who is not used to losing, he knows that returning from Ukraine without a tangible victory will be the end of him. Whether Putin can achieve these goals depends on Russia's production capacity and ability to replace the thousands of tanks and missiles destroyed and NATO's commitment to maintain its supply of heavy weapons and ammunition. If NATO continues to supply weapons to the Ukrainian armed forces and the sanctions against Russia become tougher, this long-expected war will mean nothing but destruction for Russia. A lot of updates are coming from the Donetsk region here after the recent massive wave of assaults along the whole of Dievka front. Russians degraded their forces on the ground to the point where certain Russian positions became weak. Ukrainians took advantage of the situation and started from capturing some of the most important trench networks on this front. Last time I told you that Russian assault battalion from the 5th Brigade was virtually annihilated in suicidal attacks from Virginia and that their survival rate was 11%. I also told you that Russian forces started reinforcing this region with mobilized soldiers that are not even specialized in assaults. The freshest reports indicate that Ukrainian forces took advantage of the decreased capabilities of Russian formation south of Avdiivka and conducted a counterattack. There are two important trench networks between Virginia and Seven, and each of them is located on a hill. Russians had established control over one of them a while ago, but the second position turned out to be too strong. 
Recent footage shows that Ukrainian Marines from the 36th Brigade launched an extensive artillery preparation on the three lines in front of Virginia and then stormed the strong point and established total control over the trenches. The increased control of the elevated ground allowed Ukrainians to improve their tactical position significantly. Russian failure to hold this position complicates all their plans for this direction and dispels hopes of taking Avdiivka into a pocket. In the meantime, after months of infantry fights in the fields between Pervomaysk and Navelsk, Russian forces decided to launch several tank assaults. This was the only area around Davdivka where Russians had not yet tried a heavy attack. During this new wave of offensive actions, unfortunately for Russians, they did not achieve their objectives. Combat footage reveals that the first attack was stopped by artillery. Recent footage features another attempt to push Ukrainians out of Navelsky. However, this time Ukrainian 59th Brigade seemed to have adjusted to the situation and brought in more Atkins to the sector. This time Ukrainians allowed Russians to get much closer. So when the Ukrainians opened fire, Russian tanks did not manage to run away. When it comes to the northern part of the region here, Ukrainians made another counterattack. Ukrainian spokesmen for the Tavris group of forces reported on March 30th had the Russian 200 separate motorized rifle brigade withdrew from the Avdi of Karia for recovery. Ukrainians took advantage of that situation as well and assaulted Russian positions in Novoselivka. Ukrainian soldiers from the 71st Hunting Brigade said that they were clearing these trenches so fast that Russian artillery did not manage to aim in time and was constantly firing at the already cleared trenches behind them. Such a move aims to undermine the Russian tactical position in the Bakhmutka because these trenches are located on a hill 90 meters above Novoselivka and Russian ground lines of communication in the Cross Noharivka area. Ukrainian drone operators from the 110th Mechanized Brigade continued to destroy Russian forces in the trenches in front of Avdiivka. Recently released combat footage indicates that they have cleared at least five shelters by dropping mines and grenades into the holes. Since many sectors of the Avdiivka frontline are inactive and Russians are either sitting in trenches or firing from mortars, there was too much work for one drone detachment. That is partly why Ukrainians have relocated the famous Mityur's Birds drone battalion. Such news had a bad effect on the Russian troops' morale which is why Russians even launched an information operation and circulated fake news that Mayar was killed. However, Mayar promptly dispelled the speculations and released a lot of videos with successful drone operations. One video shows how drone operators identified an enemy's modder crew, and once the crew went inside the house, they flew the drone through the door and blew it up. Russian sources also complained yesterday that Ukrainians started mining the grenade-dropping drones. This means that whenever Russians shoot it down, Ukrainians detonate it when Russians pick it up. Overall, in the aftermath of a short but very costly offensive campaign, Russian forces degraded to the point where they started to struggle to retain previously captured positions, which allowed Ukrainians to recapture tactically significant trenches on the hills. Ukrainian drone operators also continued to inflict significant damage to Russian troops on the Zero Line by constantly dropping explosives on their shelters and also hunting down their modern crews. 